slightly different soil here. This is um, some of our sand and gravelly land. Um, this was wheat uh, planted, oh, as Crusoe wheat harvest, harvested, sorry, last week of July, uh, last week of July, yep. Yeah. Um, and then planted with our cover crop through, which will go right the way through the season until this is programmed in for soya beans for next year out here. Um, and we have some rye, uh, forage rye, and then some phacelia, some buckwheat, and I haven't got a vetch in here either, but there's some vetches dotted around as well. Um, very, di very different sort of soil, um, not the stone in it, but still sort of loads of, um, loads of roots. Previous straw chopped, um, no slug pellets out here at all to get this going. Some, some fields we will do that, we will put some pellets on. Um, but it's all... Is that based on history? Like yes, yeah, we know where we sort of get problems and where they are in the rotation really. Um, so this is its, this is its third year, so this was no-till no -till peas, no-till wheat and then this is the cover crop before the soybeans. So the, um, this structure is all just sort of developing really. Um, but it's coming along really well all this all just the way when you pull it together you can you can sort of hear the roots all pulling apart um, which is a great a good sign that it's sort of all starting to happening and it's all sort of binding and holding together really um, I thought we might have some vetch with nodules on in there I just missed it Will you use any biologicals on here, Jake, for your soya? Or what, what does soya need when it's um, getting going? Well, it, it comes with its own um, inoculum. Yeah. Um, so that will that will probably be all all it has. Um, we might just oh, we might give it a bit of something to um, to help break this down, unless we can get it grazed off. Um, but. Um, plant the soil? Uh, it'll be end of April, 20th of April. Fairly late. Yeah, which gives, which gives all of this a great chance to really put on biomass. We can graze it down in the winter and because it's rye my thinking is that it'll then continue through the winter and will actually grow again in the spring. So it'll help to dry the soil out, put more roots in. Um, I know a lot of America, North American soybean crops um, are following rye and it works quite well there. So the, the buckwheat will all disappear, um, the vetches, sorry? When will the buckwheat give up? Well as soon as we get a sort of five degree C um, temperature, spring. well no just overnight, <laughs> yeah we had some sort of six degrees about what well, when was it three weeks ago yeah, something like that here yeah. and I was the, and the buckwheat was sort of this sort of size and I thought oh that was a waste of money putting that in but I know a really cheap source of buckwheat now if anybody needs any. <laughs> um, and I was thinking, oh, that's just going to kill that off, but it didn't. And, um, but it's, it's, it's down to that temperature and it doesn't take much, a, a night and it'll, it'll kill it. Um, so loads of nodules there and if you, if you pass those around, you just break them apart and you can see they're really pink inside, which is all the bacteria fixing all the nitrogen away. Um, so I'm hopeful that wheat after the soya beans um, you know, we'll be able to cut our nitrogen use back, you know, significantly, both with the vetches and then what the soybeans leave behind as well. So, we'll, we'll see. Facelia? What's the facelia doing at this stage? Facelia at this stage, not a massive amount. Um, it's really good for creating tilth, um, so very sort of fine fibrous roots in the, in the top sort of few inches. So in, in terms of Oh look, there's a worm party going on there. That's very good news. Um, so in terms of, where's my facelia gone? Here it is. In terms of what it, it brings to the party is, um, I mean, we've had 70 mil of rain in September. Uh, most of that from about the 20th of September onwards. And this is still, this is just dry now. Um, slug there. Um, so there's, there's all the facelia. So it's a reasonable sort of tap root, but I like it for all these, all the side sort of fibrous roots um, in sort of creating tilth little 
that will work next year and sort of all follow, follow around follow around the seed really. And then if this does start to flower, get to the end of October and there's a little pollen and nectar source yeah, there. It'll flower. As, it will flower. Yeah. It'll probably flower. Yeah. Yeah. Um, and if you just if you just break some of the soil o open, if anybody wants to, you can just smell. Oh, there's a worm channel through there. That's a good find. Um, it's just it just smells just smells like soil should do. It's not that sort of staley, stagnanty. What did it smell like when you came here? Did you know, did you know Didn't really it notice it too much then. Too busy subsoiling it and everything. Yeah. Yeah. Whereas whereas now it's um, you know it's just if anybody else wants a bit. You don't do any subsoiling. Don't do any, Haven't done any subsoiling. Bar where we've got some onions. We need to do a bit for those. Yeah. But if you just, you know, just break that apart and put, stick your nose into it, or even just, if you just listen to when you're pulling it apart, it sort of tears. Um, so, there's some wheat volunteers kicking around as well. Do you think um, grazing off a cover crop prior to drilling puts any more or less goodness into the soil than spraying it off and, and leaving it there. Yeah, I'm sure it probably puts puts more in because you're getting the biology out of the animal as well. Yeah, even um, though you're taking the meat off the... Yes, the yeah, you, you may well be. Well, I mean, you are if the animal's growing, I suppose. Um, but I think in, in, in the way they sort of recycle the nutrients, it's probably a faster recycling. Yes, yeah. Um, so you'll, you'll get a benefit quicker. Yeah. That can only help. I mean, it's, it's, yes. Yeah. We all keep hearing the word diversity. You know, it's another, it's another diverse addition to the soil. So, yeah. so that is the ideal thing, yeah. really, is it, to be eaten? I, and personally, yeah. to graze between a third and two thirds of the above ground biomass is is ideal because you're cycling some of those nutrients. Um, you're you're getting a, bene a cost benefit out of your <coughs> crop, um, and and your your health. Your, well, it's like a nutrient, nutrient. I've already said it, but you, yeah. you know, it's 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 a win-win situation as long as you're not damaging the soil by um, sort of puddling it when it's too wet. Yeah. And so, how would a crop of stubble, if you put instead of putting this down, you'd, you'd put stubble turnips and then graze that off with sheep. Mm. So you're not you're not getting the variety of root in. Yeah, it's this diversity. You're back to a monoculture then. Yeah. And I'm and I am guilty of that because we've we've got some fields of just straight um, stubble turnips because it's sort of a bit of a kind of rush decision where we're going to put them and then what. It's quite it takes a lot of time to work out, and this is where the sort of the, the notebook or the decision making tree would be better. Planting stubble turnips, right? What's a good companion cropping for stubble turnips? And you know, in hindsight, we probably should have chucked a couple of kilos of vetch in, or a kilo of vetch and some bursine clover, and well, like George was saying, it whatever you've got in the shed, because the sheep will come and eat it. Yeah, yeah. Would the facelia be a good choice for, for the root? Yeah, I mean, I don't, I don't see why not. Yeah, in terms of structure and things, um, you know. Yeah, I haven't yet. killed any sheep yet with that. So. <laughs> I think it's a member of the rhubarb family, so not many other things sort of eat it. Um, and I think if it was a, a monoculture of buckwheat, I would worry about putting livestock in. But in terms of a population like this, I don't know whether I'd be too worried. We haven't done anything harmful for them yet. What sort of uh, rate, kilos per hectare of buckwheat? Is in this, for, for example, not an exact amount, but how many kilos of buckwheat have you got in this? This, this uh, about three. About three. Because that seems to be the right fit, around about the threes. Yes, well, although I've, as I've got a supply of it now, I might put the rate up. <laughs> <laughs> but it was, uh, we, mixed, we mixed the rye, or we bought in the rye and the vetch. Um, as a as a combination, sort of pre-mixed, and then the bursim and the um, 
not the burst seam. The, yeah, the rye and the vetch came together because that was the same size. And then the, no, there is a bit of burst seam in here. The burst seam and the buckwheat and the phacelia, they all came together in 25 kilo bags. So we just sort of put one in one hopper and the other mix in the other one. But I think that was about three. Okay. And then these were one kilo each because there's a lot of seeds yeah. per kilo of phacelia. That was a kilo of phacelia and a kilo of burst seam as well in here. They're the most expensive of the world. Yeah. And a bit like George, I think the burst seams kind of not really showed up too much yet. But there is, there's one there. Look. So it is, yeah, they are here. Do you find that um, with the diverse mixture, you've got certain areas where different things dominate on a field, even depending on the soil type? Yeah, don't don't seem to really. Yeah. They're they're sort of that one's um, that's black oat and vetch, um, and and they they all look sort of pretty uniform. This is probably a bit of um, a bit of slightly <coughs> more compacted ground here. Um, and then there's a, that patch over there was where we had some black grass a couple of years ago. So I think sort of in-field factors would affect it a little bit more than sort of separation in the drill or anything like that. Yeah. From that point of view, it's all pretty, pretty even. Yeah. And how, how important is the finessing of, so you mentioned five or six different species in there because it gives you the diversity. And then I'm looking at it thinking crop competition, you know, if you had two kilos of buckwheat would your facility be bigger you know are you just is it the diversity and the actual finesse of the rate doesn't matter too much because they're all doing value or yeah. is there extra value in that little bit of do you think we just need to get Prob people probably probably too early to, to yeah. fine tune it that way yet and i think every year will be different um for, for me it's a case of what's going to be a sort of an average and then almost more importantly is getting it in right behind the combine for us so my five minute fallow combine drill in the same field um, to maximize you know maximize all this sunshine now and, and grow as much of everything as we possibly can a uh, little bit of cost as well um colin you mentioned bursine clover is quite expensive um so you know, you know, a bit of an eye on on the cost um this mix was uh 36 pounds a hectare um for everything you know all in for the seed we've got to plant it as well but Think you'll do your buckwheat and vetch again, or you've got enough supply now? Probably got enough supply for a year or two. <laughs> I think next. Well, next year, yeah, next year. Well, still use those in the cover crops, yeah, kind of a, on the broad acre, and then maybe exactly. find another little field and grow something else. Maybe yeah. try some bursine and, clover, and or the more seed you have on farm, the more choice you have. Absolutely. You can just keep changing it. Build, build your seed. Build a, bag build a supply in the in the store, in the store not yeah. in the yeah, field. Not in the bag brought in. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, absolutely. <laughs>